You know, hair metal gets a bad rap. The mid to late 80s was the height of metal's popularity as a genre, and hair metal was the drug of choice for many aspiring metalheads growing up in the wild and crazy 80s. So I would argue that metal would not be where it is today without the subgenre. People might point to thrash as the sound of metal in the 80s, and in hindsight it kind of makes sense because of how well most of it has aged, but people seem to forget that in the 80s, thrash wasn't exactly topping the charts. Hair metal, however, was. With aggressive riffs, lightning fast lead work, bombastic drums, vocalists that reach the upper registers and then some, bass that is there I guess, and just in general, crazy good musicianship. In this genre, all you have to do is throw a dart and you'll find a band with amazing players. Except Poison. And as good as it was for about a decade, by the end of the 1980s, the genre started to get very bad and very formulaic. Bands like Bon Jovi, Winger, White Lion, Pretty Boy Floyd, Slaughter, Bang Tango, and of course the aforementioned Poison, were really giving the genre a bad name. Hair metal as we know it was going the way of the dodo and was on its deathbed, but one band came about and injected some much needed edge back into it, and that band was Skid Row. Formed in 1986 by bassist Rachel Bowen and guitarist Dave the Snake Sabo, whom the latter, fun fact, was actually an original member of Bon Jovi, they recorded some demos with a guy named Matt Fallon, who was briefly a member of Anthrax, and he got kicked out of both bands before either of them made it big. Damn, that's gotta suck. But in 1987, Dave and Rachel found the last remaining pieces of the classic lineup of the band, including Rob Afuso on drums, Scotty Hill as a second guitar player, and the vocalist who defined the band, Sebastian Bach. A man whose voice can part the seas. He's definitely one of the best vocalists of the late 80s and early 90s, even though he got mad at me on Twitter one time. And in 1989, they released the self-titled debut album. And even though it hasn't aged too well, it's still overall a really enjoyable listen. It combined the sleaziness that a lot of other hair bands were doing at the time, and combined it with spine-cracking riffs that just punish. Cuts like Piece of Me, Midnight Tornado, Big Guns, and Rattlesnake Shake are some of my personal favorites. And of course the ballads, 18 and Life and I Remember You, are pretty good as well. And there's a track that was recorded but was never released until the 40 Seasons Best Of called Forever. And it's low-key one of the best songs this band ever did. So it's an anomaly how it didn't make the cut for the album. God knows there's plenty of tracks that it could have replaced. Then two years later, the band's second release, Slave to the Grind, actually hit number one on the Billboard charts, making it one of the heaviest albums to ever chart that high. Which is really interesting because Slaves to the Grind was a deliberate attempt to heavy up their sound by introducing thrash and speed metal elements into the mix. It's also a much darker album overall, and not only is the sound much darker, but the lyrics are too, the ballads especially, dealing with subjects such as questioning your religion, drug addiction, and even child abuse. The band had clearly matured in the two years since the debut record. Slave to the Grind is just a marvelous album, all the way through. Even the dumber tracks are really good as well. Ooh, never gets old. But some things should be apparent. You might be thinking, if Skid Row had two Smash albums, then how come they didn't have more? Well, three months after Slave to the Grind was released, think about what came out. So it should go without saying that Skid Row's days were numbered and there was no way in hell that they were going to survive in the current musical landscape. But with that being said, I think they gave it a fair shot. In 1995, they released Subhuman Race, and damn, this must have been a shock to people who remembered Skid Row for their heartfelt ballads. Because like Slave to the Grind was before it, Subhuman Race is a much darker and heavier album than what preceded it only to an even larger extreme than what Slave did. 
In fact, it's pretty hard to tell that this was the same band who recorded songs like Youth Gone Wild. Many of the songs grind and sound very sinister. During the tour for Slave to the Grind, they took Pantera out as their opening act. And you can definitely tell. The riffs and guitar playing are very in your face and abrasive, much like Dimebag Darrow's playing. And Sebastian Bach's performance seems meaner and far more intense on this album than he used to be. Kinda like Phil Anselmo. And keep in mind that Sebastian was already a very intense performer. So he basically went from 10 to 11. So in this album there's a lot of groove metal elements, a lot of sludge elements, and even a lot of grunge elements. And considering that Skid Row's fan base was largely made up of party hardy hard rock and metal fans, they weren't exactly on board with this new direction, since it only went gold and the last two albums were multi-platinum. And it only just charted in the top 40 after the last album went to number 1, and the previous one went to number 5. But even then they also lost a lot of albums after their sophomore release. So I guess after the first album, they were just in a pattern of diminishing returns. But there's also two other factors to look into. One is the already established change in the musical landscape, with hair metal dying such a death that any band associated with the genre was thrown to the wayside, even if they updated their sound in a way that could be easily palatable for that era. Honestly, if any other band released this album, it probably would have done better. But because it said Skid Row on it, no one would touch it. And there's also the fact that the band were basically falling apart at the time. They were basically forced by the label to record a new album, even though they didn't want to. There was also rising tensions growing amongst the members, which ultimately led to the band breaking up. But we'll get to that later. So the aggression that can be heard on this album is 100% genuine. It wasn't an arbitrary thing like, oh, we gotta be Pantera now. They were just really pissed off. They are pissed off at their label, the current musical climate, their singer, they were just full of rage. And that rage is on full display in the first single and opening track, My Enemy. It's driven by a gnarly sounding riff that runs through your head like a chainsaw and it absolutely pulverizes. It's super dark and foreboding, which is definitely amplified by the video. And it sounds great too. It was produced by Bob Rock, who I'm usually not a huge fan of because his production style is very slick, and he often wipes away any grit and bite from just about everything he produces. For the most part, his style is very sterile and dry, but this is definitely the best production he's ever done because it just sounds disgusting in the best possible way. Which makes sense because a subhuman race isn't supposed to be pretty, which segues us into the title track. It's very punky and is an absolute wrecking ball to the senses. And that slow, grinding guitar part just hits me in my soul. And I don't know if it's just me, but the timing is ever so slightly off, which really adds to the feeling of uneasiness you feel while listening to the track. And the punky elements continue on Bonehead, which goes a million miles an hour, and I love it so much even though the vocal performance can get a little questionable. And the punk elements make sense because Rachel Bowen is a huge punk fan. Hell, even sang on a cover of Psychotherapy by the Ramones a few years prior to this. Beat Yourself Blind is carried by a chunky as fuck bass line that just slimes through the song. And the chorus is just plain bizarre with just a blood-curdling scream from Sebastian of the title over and over again until it burrows into your head. I usually wouldn't be a big fan of something like this, but here I think it really works. Then we also have the other singles, which are more on the lighter side, probably to try and save face so this record wouldn't completely bomb, which didn't exactly work, but anyway, we move. The second single was Breaking Down, the ballad of the record. It's not quite like the previous ballads this band has done, this one's even more melancholic than usual, and it's extremely dour. It's about someone just being at wit's end with their life, and the song accurately conveys the darkness and sadness someone would feel in a situation like that. You can feel the pain in every scream Sebastian lets out, and that guitar solo just takes the song to a whole new level. In fact, the guitar work on this entire album is amazing. Dave the Snake Sabo and Scotty Hill are one of the unsung great guitar duos of the 80s and 90s in my opinion. The final single was Into Another, 
by far the grungiest song on this album, and definitely them trying to move the times. And it honestly works way better than it has any right to. It's in the time signature of 7-4, which is bizarre, but it adds to the kind of off feeling the song has. This track works because it doesn't take away any of the good things about this band, but instead they just add a really gruesome sounding atmosphere. Also on this album we have probably the best thing this band has ever done, Eileen. Now this song stands out as being strange and weird as fuck, and it's on an album that is known as being strange and weird as fuck. It's kind of a ballad, but I would argue that it's actually much more than that, because it goes into way too many different directions to be considered as such. The whole song has a feeling of almost paranormal intent, as if they're conjuring a witch or something. It's creepy and spooky all the way through, but it sounds downright demented at the end with that punishing riff in the repeated line of, I know what she knows. <laughs> If they released this as the first single, then I guarantee you this album could have done way better. It probably wouldn't have done the numbers the previous records did, but that's mostly because of Skid Row's past would kind of hold them back in that regard, but a song like this would have definitely gotten people to take notice. Overall, this album is extremely solid and there's no outright bad tracks. Some are better than others, sure, but I can at the very least appreciate every song. So in that regard, it's better than at least the debut record because there's no shitty songs like Can't Stand the Heartache, and I would also probably put it at least on par with Slaves to the Grind. And it even got some pretty good reviews despite it bombing commercially, but the fans did not like it at all, and neither did the band for that matter. Sebastian Bach called it the Saint Anger of Skid Row's career, and Rachel Boland said that it quote, absolutely sucks. Rachel, have you heard Revolutions Per Minute? But I mainly chalk that up to members having bad memories surrounding the recordings and the album in general because it pretty much broke up the band. And because it broke up the band, it literally killed their career. Bach was kicked out of Skid Row in 1996, and the reasoning for him being fired was that Rachel declined an opening slot for the Kiss Reunion tour because he was busy with his side project, Prunella Scales. And the rest of the band also apparently said they were too big to open for Kiss. Which I didn't know how true that is since they have opened for several bands before and after this incident, including KISS. Bach then left a pretty nasty message for Rachel on his answering machine, and after that he was promptly given the boot. After that the band broke up and renamed themselves Ozone Monday with a different singer. But in 1999, they reunited Skid Row and have used several different singers and even drummers since Robbie Fuso also left the band. And it's just not the same. None of the singers they've had since can recapture the fire that Sebastian Bach had in that band. And the records they've done since have ranged from mediocre to Jesus Christ Kill Me Now. Meanwhile, Sebastian's solo career is actually pretty enjoyable, but even then, it doesn't even hold a candle to any of the Skid Row records he sang on. They really do need each other, whether they like to admit it or not. I've heard the other members lament people being hung up on Sebastian not being there, saying stuff like, oh, we wrote the songs, he only sang them. Which may be true, but Bach was the face of the band. He was by far the most recognizable member, and he gave the songs a life of their own. Hell, go listen to the demos of the first album with Matt Fallon on vocals, and it just doesn't even hold a candle. Also, Sebastian is the only member most casual fans can even name. Only hardcore fans even know the other guys. And with all due respect to them, they're great musicians, and Rachel's my favorite member of the band. But the fact of the matter is, Skid Row without Sebastian is like cereal without milk. And it doesn't help when everyone they've gotten to sing since Sebastian just aren't that good. C.P. Thornton might be a nice guy and all, but he can't sing a battle to save his life. Ricky was a young boy, he had a heart of stone. For more metal related videos, click here, and if you enjoyed the video, please give it a like, it helps out a lot. 
And if you really like the video, feel free to subscribe and click the bell. I do videos like this really often, so do that to remain notified. Anyway, take it easy, party people.